We have made it all the way to the end of To Be Continued. So you get the big culmination today. What I do need your help with is right out there is a crock pot, the lucky pot. For the next series to work, you have to put all those hankering, odd, weird, whatever questions that float around in your head that you go, I read this the other day in the Bible, and what the heck does that mean? Or I was wondering, it has to go in the pot, otherwise I can't pull anything out to be lucky and then go, oh, and here's what's happened. And so we've, we've pulled things out of there, and sometimes it's, oh, it's a one-week deal, and the question is answered, or at least answered to the best of my ability. Um, and sometimes it's two weeks, and then we've had other ones like the Heaven series or the Sexuality series that took us like five, six, seven weeks long because sometimes there are bigger questions than others and they need more time. So who knows what will come out, stick it in, and here's what I do reserve the right is uh, I reserve the right to either say, no, I'm not going to answer that, or maybe not yet. I, I don't tend to say no, but... I want to reserve that right just in case. So feel free, stick your stuff in there. If you don't put anything in there, then you just get whatever I come up with as something goofy to talk about for the next couple of weeks. We have, we have made it through Luke 24 and the beginning of Acts 1, at least the first 12-ish verses. Um, and I guess I should say... Uh, you, those of you that are um, not savvy to um, to Disney movies, you'll have to forgive me, okay? Just nod along and forgive me. For those of you that are savvy to Disney movies, then it, it'll be okay. No! Oh, who was it? I can't lift both my hands up or it'll stretch my shirt too far. <laughs> we'll just leave him here because we're coming back to that, okay? So now that I got all your little kids' attention, you can feel free to go back to your little things or pay a little closer attention because we're, we're coming back, okay? I'm going to pray now that we got that out of the way. It will come back later, so don't be scared when it does. I gave you your warning. And then we will jump in. Spirit, I ask that this morning amidst uh, a busy weekend, maybe a fun weekend, maybe a heavy weekend, for families that, that remember those that they've lost, those that have served to give us the freedom to stand here and, and sing and pray and read your words, be with us. Be with us now, be with us in the days ahead. I pray that in this moment you would transcend our space and our time and speak. That like in the beginning of all things, you spoke and your word brought into existence. Your word brought the light of life. Your word brought life into Adam's lungs that the dirt of, a gr of the ground, Adama, became Adam. I pray that you would speak that same life today. Your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, Dave, I apologize. We did not talk about all the slides that are involved in today. There is a lot. We'll just kind of truck through and... I honestly don't remember them all, so uh, we may skip a few. There may be some where they pop up on there and I go, oh wait, we got to talk about that. Uh, but what we're going to do is I'm going to read through Luke 24, the very end, because we've made it through the whole chapter now, and then I'm going to read the, the section in Acts 1, 9 through 11 so that you can hear them separately, and then remember that Luke wrote them as two separate things. And then what we're going to do is I took the liberty of merging them together so that you could hear them as they would be written as one. This is my assumption of Luke gets to the end of writing and he's been writing for quite a while and he kind of wraps it up real quick and then he gets to the beginning of the next book that he's writing, the Acts of the Church of the Apostles of the Holy Spirit, and he goes, oh, I forgot to add that part. 
and that part. This is the, the extra stuff that he kind of missed. So Luke 24, 50 through 53. If you have your Bible with you, it is helpful. It will be on the screen, obviously not the version where I, I merge them together, but Luke 24. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. That's Luke. That, that is the end of the book of Luke. Now we get to the beginning of Acts, and here we're at Acts 1, verse 9. After he had said this, this is we talked about last week, they ask him, it's been 40 days, they walk out towards Bethany, the Mount of Olives, and, and they ask him, is this the time when you're going to restore Israel? And we talk through all the covenantal language and all of the things that were in, in the forefront of their mind, and he doesn't tell them no, he says, it's on you. I'm giving you something. God is giving you something, and then he proceeds. So after he says this, then he's taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going. Then suddenly, two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who, you, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back. He will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Okay, so let, let's put this together. This is both versions put together how I think Luke would have intended had he rewritten those sections again. So what you would hear is, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven, and a cloud hid them from their sight. And they were looking intently into the sky as he was going, and suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Then they worshiped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Okay, make, make a fair amount of sense as you saw them kind of merge together. You could see where, where what Luke has done in the past was we didn't hear anything about the 40 days in the section previous in chapter 24, and then he starts talking about the 40 days. So this is the culmination of their 40 days, and if you're person that's been around Sunday school or the church for a while, you know that 40 days, 40 years, the number 40 comes up a whole lot in the Bible and especially within God's action within people's, people's lives. But what I think is helpful is we need to define a few terms. So uh, a few things that we need to take a look at is we need to, especially within this section, is we need to talk about heaven, we need to talk about clouds, and we need to talk about taken up. So first, we have heaven. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of scripture passages. I have a few scripture passages for, for the rest of them, but here's, here's the general mindset. When you read something that says heaven, you either see sky or the place of the stars, the upper areas, or the place where God is. Right in this section within Luke, what you can't see is a Greek word that's translated heaven and sky and not so much stars in this but in the old testament especially where when we say the word heaven or when he's lifted up into the sky the words are all the same all of them now the part that's kind of hard for us is how do we grasp or wrap our minds around like so if i ask you where is heaven well it's like up up there right well, didn't that Yuri, whatever his name, the first cosmonaut, go up into space and come back down and goes, I was up there, didn't see God. Oh. Well, and we've been up there. We've seen pictures. Elon Musk is starting a colony somewhere. He hasn't talked about God up there. So there's that place. So, so where is it? Now, 
Some, here's where I should have had Andrew come up and explain this now that you're here. Uh, so so um, you see this? Sorry, Simba. You liked them skills, didn't you? What is it? <laughs> that a girl. This is a watermelon. This some of you may in doubt eat this weekend. Not, not this one. This one's mine. You can't have it. Uh, it's a watermelon, but, but inside of it is what? What is this watermelon made of? Water. And there's some seeds and there's some like pulp and fiber. But when you get down to the, the molecular level, what is this made of? Andrew, what's this made of? No, 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 no. Get to the molecular level. And those are made up of? Atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, within protons and neutrons, then you have things like called quarks, up and down quarks, gluons, within those, then maybe there are strings, we have no idea, but the point I'm saying is, can you see those things? No. Anybody read Horton, here's a who? What if we're the who? Now take a second. What if we're the who? For those of you that haven't read Horton, Here's a Who, it's like Horton, this big elephant, hears a whole colony of people, of things, on this little, what is it? Is it like a flower or a dust speck or something? A dandelion. So, so we look at this and go, oh, watermelon, but deep, deep down inside is lots and lots of protons, neutrons, electrons, all flying around, and you go, oh, I can't see that stuff. Now, when you stand and you think along a cosmic sort of mindset... How big is God? How do you know that to God we're not the who's? Or the protons, electrons, and neutrons, the little things? I was reading through C.S. Lewis, the guy that wrote the Narnia books, also wrote a set of books about this space trilogy. And in the second book, where they, the guy goes to what we know as Venus, but what he calls Paralandra, he encounters heavenly beings, and when he encounters them, he's trying to have a conversation with them, but he's distracted because it looks like their hair is blowing in the wind and that they're moving, even though they don't look to be moving, because they stand outside of time. He's on a planet that spins around, and here's where you go, C.S. Lewis is so smart. The planet moves around, right? We understand that our planet moves in a circle, and then it's an elliptical orbit around the sun. Yeah, will you turn that back off for me, please? And so as it's moving, things that stand outside of time don't move. So it appears to them like these angels are moving in front of them because they have to move to keep up with him because he's stationary, but everything else around him is moving. Some of you are like, yeah, I don't know what that means. Like, it's okay. That's, that's like fifth grade science right there, and most of us are moved beyond that. All that to say is, where's God? He could be right here. Literally. Literally. Where is heaven? It could be right here. Because it stands outside of our space and time, but somehow we go, he went into heaven? Like up in the scars, beyond the stars, like into the place where God is? And God could be right here, right here, right now. As you would notice, most weeks I say, God, will you speak? Will you be here with us? There are times when I actually say, will you just rend open that doorway to heaven so that when we have things like you see in the book of Revelation or the prophets where they go, and the doorway was open and I saw the heavenlies. I saw into that other place. Well, how do you think that happens? Because God says, I've been here the whole time. You are the who on the speck and I am the big thing outside that you can't see it. Now, okay, did that confuse most of you? No, we're all on the same page. Let's move on then. Cloud. So Jesus is, is taken up into heaven in, and hidden by a cloud. So we have clouds like regular clouds. You look outside and you see a cloud. That works. 
You also see in the beginning of Genesis where God says, from these clouds, then I will give you a rainbow as a sign of my covenant. Okay, well, then he's talking about regular clouds. Or when Elijah is doing battle with the prophets of Baal and he says, go off and look. And they're like, we don't see nothing and it hasn't rained for how long? 40 days. 40 days. 40 is important. It hasn't rained and he goes, go and look again. And then all of a sudden, go and look again. And I see a tiny little speck of something and then the cloud comes. So there's normal clouds, but there's also clouds that look the same but are not the same. Exodus 13, verse 21. Now by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Remember, from this context, this is the people of Israel had been in captivity in Egypt longer than we've had a United States of America. Just put that into perspective. They were slaves longer than we've even thought about being a free state. And so as they start walking out into the great unknown wilderness, they don't know what's out there. God shows up in a cloud of smoke during the daytime and a pillar of fire at night to lead them. You go a little bit further, Exodus 24, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and now the Hebrew here syntax is not, and a cloud covered it, but the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. In my, in my mind, this, I don't know that they found a volcano near where the Mount Sinai that they believe is, but this is the thought that I have. Like, this is the picture that I see. Then Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain and stayed on the mountain 40 days, 40 nights. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so, so here we have the grasp, a little bit of the Old Testament, is that God shows up as a cloud. His presence is represented by a cloud. You see, when Solomon dedicates the temple, God's presence shows up in a cloud. Now, when we get to the New Testament, you can go, let's just go Luke 9. I think I have one in there. Yes, I do. Now, while he was speaking, this is Jesus, taking Peter, Paul, and James up the mountainside. They'd been praying. Now, when he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Here we see in the New Testament as well, God's presence shows up as a cloud. So we've covered heaven, we've covered cloud, now we get the taken up. Uh, This is where we get the word or the phrase within the church, the ascension or ascension Sunday, which was technically last Sunday. Is this Pentecost or is next week Pentecost? I should know these things. Resident scholar is not doing his due diligence. (laughs) So when we look at taken up, it can mean to lift up, it can mean to lead, it can mean to carry or bear something. Um, When you get into the Old Testament and the Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, this is where 70 of these um, resident scholar Hebrews that were in Alexandria at the time said, there's so many people that know Greek but don't know Hebrew because Alexander the Great conquered most of the world and gave them the Greek language. Before him, the Persians had spread people out, and the Babylonians had spread people out, and the Assyrians had spread people out. And so the Jewish people are all over, but they begin to hear of this God of the Israelites, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so these Alexandrians decide that they're going to write down. And so they translate the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament, into Greek, just like we have the Old Testament in 
English or Spanish or French or whatever. You open your Bible app and there's a hundred and some different languages. In there, they use the word for lift up or taken up or ascend to mean specifically within the context of sacrifices presented before the Lord, a presentation of a sacrifice before the altar of the Lord, before the cloud of the Lord and the mercy seat on the day of atonement. You get into the New Testament, and here in Matthew and Mark, these are two of the Gospels that kind of piggyback each other. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. This is right before the transfiguration. And he led them up privately on a high mountain. Now, the word here that Matthew and Mark both use is the word that gets translated led. Where are they led to? The cloud. Right before the presentation of the Lord, he is bringing them into the presence of God. You go through a little further, and here we have James. And, and I should just say, the word taken up within the New Testament is used nine times. It's only used once by Luke in this passage. It's used a few times by Matthew and Mark, by James, and by Peter and whoever writes Hebrews. Within James, we get, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Something is offered, same word in Greek, presented before the Lord. Now the context here is James then goes on to say, no, it wasn't in the thing that he did, but in his faith that God counted as righteous. Uh, and I won't take you through all of the Peter and the Hebrew passages because those are all pertaining to sacrifices. Now, now why is this stuff important? Well, we have... We have taken up, presented before the Lord in a very specific way, a sacrifice, presented before the Lord in a pleasing way. This is, this is um, sometimes in the Old Testament that would be a wave offering is presented. You show the Lord what you're giving him. Something is lifted up special. So we have something lifted up in a special way that's only used in special language of before God. And then we have this cloud, which represents God's presence, which hid Jesus from their sight. And then we have heaven, where Jesus went. He was lifted up, taken into the sky, the heaven, the place where God is. Now, here's where you get a... I'm not going to do it again because y'all heard it before. <laughs> You get to the beginning of, of, of The Lion King and what happens? You hear the song and you know immediately what it is, right? But you know that there's something else because that's just the beginning of the story. But what does it mean for us? Here you're going to have to put your Bible nerd head on for just a little bit more. Daniel chapter 2. This is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, has. And Daniel interprets the dream. The thing is, is he doesn't tell anybody the dream. Nebuchadnezzar goes, I ain't going to tell you what the dream is because then you're not that wise of a wise man. What do I care if you guys can tell me what you think it means after I tell you what it is? You tell me what the dream was and then interpret it to me and I'll believe you. Daniel goes home and prays with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he gets the dream. For your majesty, I looked. And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partially of iron and partially of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. And it struck the statue on its feet and the iron and the clay and smashed them. 
And the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summertime. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock, the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. And then here is his interpretation. I'm cutting out some of the portions just so we're not sitting here reading this long prophetic vision. In the time of those kings, all of the different kingdoms that were represented by the gold and the silver and the bronze and the iron and the clay, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. A kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all of those kingdoms and bring them to an end but itself it will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold into pieces. Now, what you should hear within here is an interesting play on um, Daniel was an Israelite, right? Right? Yes, he was an Israelite. And who's the great king of the Israelites? Not yet. David. What did David do with a rock? Goliath. He slayed a giant. So an image that is from his own stories comes up again. A great statue, a giant of different kingdoms in different fashions and forms and gold and silver, but a rock will hit that giant and it will crumble to pieces. And that little rock will become a mountain. Now, when you look through the Old Testament, what happens on mountains? God shows up on mountains. The mountain of the Lord. Okay, well, maybe you're not thinking this is as nerdy or cool as I am. We'll get a little further and then we'll draw the pieces together. Daniel 7, he goes a little bit further. I'll leave out all the crazy angel talk and being beside the river so that you don't get weirded out. But here's a vision that he has. Now, as I looked, thrones were set in place. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His his clothing was as white as snow, and the hair on his head was as white as wool, and his throne was flaming with fire, and wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing out from before it, and thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten times ten thousand stood before him. Now, most of that stuff you go, what? Just remember, he doesn't know how to explain what he's seeing. That thing where I said where heaven's all around and you can't see it until God goes, let me let you see something a second. But what he says is, and the court was seated. The heavenly hosts with God presiding the Ancient of Days takes a seat. And the books were opened. Those of you that have read through Revelation and some of that, then you go, oh, that's where John gets all that crazy stuff he talks about because it's not that crazy. And my vision that night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man. This is the ancient Israelite way of saying, Ezekiel uses this phrase all the time, that God talks to Ezekiel and God says to Ezekiel, listen here, son of man. It just means mortal, human being. And then one, like a human being, not a heavenly host, not a scary angelic thing, one, like a human being, was coming with the clouds of heaven. Oh, were we talking about clouds earlier? Were we talking about heaven earlier? Were we talking about one that is heavenly but looks like a man? Did you not hear him talk about that maybe the last series we had, standing before Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin? And they go, give us an answer. And he says, you will see one like the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Why did he say that? Because this is the story of God seated in his heavenly courtroom, 
pronouncing judgment. And you will see someone like the Son of Man coming in with the clouds of glory. And what happens to him is he approaches the Ancient of Days. And he was led, led into his presence. Remember, we talked about the word taken up, also translated led. Led into his presence. And he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. And all the nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. What did he say about the kingdom that would never be destroyed? Started out as a little rock, turned into a mountain. Now, now what does this mean then? You get back to the Simba gets raised up, nobody Simba, and you watch it and you go, oh, but what you wait for is when the crazy monkey comes in about an hour and 23 minutes later and he goes, the king has returned, right? That's the part that you go, ooh, I like that. And Simba walks in looking like his father and they're like, ooh, what is this? But it took a little time. You see, Jesus comes on the scene and he brings his disciples out to tell them it has begun. It's begun. See, what they wanted was the culmination. They wanted the mountain. They wanted the mountain of the Lord to take all things. Lord, is this the time when you're going to bring Israel back? When you're going to fulfill your covenant? And Jesus tosses the stone and goes, I gave you power. I give you authority. I give you the rock to go. But what we want is the king has returned right? The struggle for all of us is you, to your left, to your right, if you followed along with all the disciples that didn't believe it, you should actually have a struggle where you go, what? Dead people don't come back to life. Grave clothes don't get folded nice in the corner which tells you that Jesus didn't do the Hulk Hogan and tear him off, that the angels came and attended him, laid them nicely. For all of you slobs out there, you should get a little, fold your things up nice. Just kidding. They don't believe, because you shouldn't believe those things. It takes faith to believe those things. You can't just look at it and go, oh yeah, totally. That definitely happened. No, it didn't just definitely happen. It happened. And it matters. And then he has to open their minds. We saw the Dorito bag tear open like all of a sudden they saw a glimpse. And now they see the big picture. And he tells them, this right here is all you need. Just the first half, first two-thirds, that's all you need. But if you ask me to come, I'll come inside. I'll sit at your table. I'll eat your food. I'll show you a bigger picture of who I am. He shows you that the scars that he had meant something and that your hurts and your pains don't just have to be something that you bury down deep inside, but he takes them and says, see, see what salvation can do. See what my grace can do. It can take the hurt, the pain, the angst and bring something else out of it. Most of y'all that live around here should know what good black dirt is made of. Not good stuff. It usually smells really bad, but it makes things grow. Because sometimes the worst things in our lives are the seed for the gospel that grows into something amazing. Jesus talked about a little mustard seed turning into a tree. I wonder where he got that idea of a rock becoming a mountain. Something grand. See, you get all the way through this and he takes them out to the side of the mountain. Forty days have come and gone. Forty days have come and gone. Now? Are you going to do it now? And he tosses the rock and says, you are the to be continued. Continued. 